for joining us. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm hoping more people will kind of file in. There's a lot going on today, but thank you so much for joining us um, for our business issues policy team forum. Um, our policy teams are educational opportunities for ABOR members to get involved in policy issues, do some deep dives, but also we provide opportunities for policy team members to attend stakeholder meetings with the city. They help us uh, craft our policy agenda every year. So if you're interested at all in advocacy, policy teams is a great way to start. Uh, you can sign up at any time throughout the year. We'd love to have you. Um, thank you again for joining us for our discussion about land development code amendments, at current council actions, and possible solutions to fill the gaps in our housing economy. Um, in a moment, I'll turn it over to Jacob, our business issues policy team lead to get us started. But before I do so, a little bit of housekeeping. If you would like to ask a question today, you can scan the QR code on the piece of paper in front of you. Or if you're attending and watching virtually, you can scan the QR code on your screen and that'll take you to our Q&A um, app. And uh, you can submit questions at any point throughout the panel and at the end, or throughout the panel conversation and at the end, I'll try to get through as many questions as possible through, during the Q&A portion of our program. Um, I wanted to give a quick shout out to our 2023 Tree Pack champions and 2023 Tree Pack major investors. We would not be able to do the work that we do if it wasn't for their support. Uh, so thank you so much if you're investing in Tree Pack. If you want to learn more about investing in Tree Pack, please feel free to reach out to me or Eileen at the back of the room. We'd love to tell you more. We have some fun events coming up and we'd love for you to join. All right, I will go ahead and hand it over to Jacob to get us started. Thank you, Jacob. Okay, all right, can everybody hear me? All right, let's start this. Yeah, we're good, I got the fancy one. Okay, well, thank you, Elizabeth, for that welcome. Uh, as the business issues policy team lead, I'm proud of the work that our advocacy team is doing for our industry and the communities we serve, so today's panel is gonna be awesome. Uh, this fine panelists over here to my right have years experience on the topic, and uh, we're excited to hear what they have to say and enlighten us so that we are all better and smarter and can serve our consumers and clients better again. So let's go. Starting first to my right, Jessica Lehman is the Senior Associate State Director of Outreach and Advocacy, which fits easily on a shirt. For AARP Texas, she's responsible for sharing AARP information and resources on a variety of topics from fraud to family caregiving across Central Texas. She advocates at the local level for liv livable community policies that allow older adults to age in their home and community, something we very, very need here in Austin. All right, she began her work in AARP in Louisiana in 2007, leading the community engagement efforts in the Holly Grove neighborhood of New Orleans shortly after Hurricane Katrina and joined the Texas AARP in 2010. Let's welcome Jessica. <laughs> Oh, one more line, sorry. Her oldest son, Jacob, just left for college. Uh, no, no relation to me. Uh, she spends most of her time walking, paddleboarding with her youngest son, Noah, and her two dogs, Brendan and Dale. And the world famous, Dr. Losey, in the middle, uh, is Abor's housing economist. If you haven't seen her podcast, it's amazing. Uh, it, it's good blurbs all we every week for uh, good things to talk to your clients about. All right, she helps unpack the complex data and keeps realtors up to date on the latest trends in the Austin housing market and broader economy. She's passionate about providing accurate, timely, and relevant analysis and stuff that we can understand. And commentary on the Austin economy and housing market that allows realtors to better understand current conditions in the market, optimize their business practices accordingly. Prior to ABOR, uh, Claire worked at the Texas, Research, Texas Real Estate Research Center at Texas A&M University for seven years. She earns her bachelor's degree at the University of Texas at Austin, her master's in land and land economics and real estate from Texas A&M University, and is a doctor in urban and regional science from Texas A&M University. Diego Maggies. In her free time, Claire loves running, reading, spending time with family and friends, and she's a volunteer with the South Austin Rotary Club. She also volunteers as an usher for the St. David's Episcopal Church. Welcome, Claire. Dr. Losey, excuse me. Taylor Smith, the man on the end. Taylor Smith is the Deputy Director of Government Affairs here at ABOR. He is the man when it comes to the city and everything to do with that. That just sums up that whole paragraph, do you want to read it? No. All right, 
<laughs> no. Taylor closely monitors and advises local public policy issues that impact Central Texas realtors. Taylor brings a wealth of experience and connections to ABOR, holds a master's in public administration from the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University. Having worked in public policy in Austin for nearly a decade, he loves maintaining effective relationships with elected officials, city staff, and other stakeholders to protect realtors and help shape the future of Central Texas. When he's not working, he enjoys the outdoors, cooking, hosting dinner parties, painting, reading, and spending time with friends and family. Welcome, Taylor. Hey, Jacob, before we move on, do you want to move your mic up a little bit for us moving, online? Moving on up in the world. Is that better? You're... I can talk louder, too, if you want. Okay, let's get started. So to kick things off, can each of you give us an update on what you've been working on related to advancing housing policy solutions? So Jessica, can you explain why AARP is interested in local housing policies and what AARP has been working on locally this year? Sure. Um, so AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan mission organi membership organization with a mission to empower people to live in the manner of their choosing as they age. And so we advocate for policies around that really impact all families. So health security, financial stability, and personal fulfillment. And housing really is at the core of all three of those things. It impacts our health, it impacts our finances, and of course living in a neighborhood with social connections that we love has, is key to our personal fulfillment. Um, and then if you don't know, by 2030, um, one in five U.S. residents will be age 65 or older. Wow. By 2034, the number of adults age 65 and older will be larger than the number of children um, 18 or younger. So what used to be a, a pyramid like this is now inverting like that. Um, and so AARP has been working for a long time around livable community policies that allow for this change in demographic to age in place and, and live in their um, communities for as long as they want. And Austin is no exception to these numbers. In 2011, the city demographer did a presentation for then Mayor Leffingwell cautioning him about the seniors or the silver tsunami. Now, I don't like to think of aging as a natural disaster that's coming to destroy <laughs> our cities. Um, I like a silver reservoir of experience spring, and knowledge maybe. that um, <laughs> you can share in the community. But so at that time, AARP and another, a number of other organizations um, worked with the city to join the network of age-friendly communities and create an action plan based on the eight domains of livability, housing being one of them. And through that process, we did a number of listening sessions across Austin. And what we heard overwhelmingly is that um, older adults want to stay in their communities as they age, and this is echoed in our national um, AARP housing preference survey, that people want to stay in their community and not have to leave just because they're older or can't necessarily stay in their home. Um, so since then, we've advocated for a number of things, like increasing funding for the city of Austin's architectural barrier removal program, which helps um, older homeowners modify their homes so they can age in place. We've looked at... Um, representing uh, residential ratepayers on utilities, um, payday lending ordinances, and, and regulation of that industry, which can disparately impact older adults, as well as multimodal transportation policies like Project Connect and Complete Streets. So this past year, we really focused on housing because we have a political will in Austin now that's interested in looking at this, this, this issue and making this type of housing, re-legalizing, I should say, this type of residential housing. And so with the home resolution, that is, you know, we're super excited about that as well as some of the work that has been done around site plan review. So that's where where we are right now and why we're doing what we're doing. Awesome. And that's a great training. Can you give us a quick recap on the city of Austin and what city council has been working on in the past nine months related to housing and any policy priorities that ABOR is focused on? Yeah, of course. Uh, I'll start kind of with the first, uh, the, the latter part. Um, for 2023, ABOR, we've been focused on kind of four main key areas, um, working with the city of Austin, but then also Travis County and some of our surrounding communities. Um, and, and the first one is to increase our housing stock and the housing capacity and variety of types of homes uh, so that we have those opportunities for, for people to choose from you know, a single family home to a duplex to a townhome to a, a cottage court. Uh, so with that, we've been encouraging uh, council 
the city council, uh, Austin City Council, to prioritize, pri prioritize housing affordability, uh, reduce barriers to housing, improve the permit process as well. Um, and which kind of ties into our second effort that we've been doing is to also reduce the cost of housing. So um, what it takes to bring that housing online as quickly as possible, but at the most affordable and attainable uh, cost point. Um, so that that's working with the city to identify process improvements, uh, to lower development fees when possible, um, um, and to also exempt um, some type of residential uh, developments from um, the permitting process. So in the city of Austin, um, if you're a single family home, you, d you do not have to go through the site, the long site plan process. Um, and so council this year actually exempted three units or less from that same process. And so now we're just working with council to actually make sure that's implemented uh, properly so that you know, if you're building a duplex or a triplex or just even row homes, that we can bring those uh, to the to the market qu faster and at a more affordable price. Um, and then our last two kind of priorities for 2023 are encouraging and supporting home ownership. And as part of that, we, we've been encouraging council and the city of Austin to look at our down payment assistance programs to actually revise those programs to uh, make sure that people that are eligible to um, participate in those programs actually have a home that they can afford within the city of Austin. For example, uh, you might be able to qualify for a $200,000 loan through that program, but there's not an actual $200,000 home that you can qualify for. So looking at increasing those uh, those um, income limit, not income limits, but what you can afford through that program would also help uh, go a long way as well. Um, and then our last priority is just kind of working to protect the tenant landlord relationship uh, so that property managers and their residents um, can work through issues that they have together. Um, and related to all of that, th this council I would say uh, is probably one of the most active councils uh, the past eight months when it's come to housing priorities and actually advancing. They've initiated a lot of uh, re additional reforms. Uh, they did some ADU reforms, which is accessory dwelling units, looking at how can we make it easier for property owners to, to build an ADU on their property, um, to either rent it out or to um, put it for sale. Uh, they're doing additional compatibility changes and well, again, we can dive into that more. Compatibility just limits what you can do uh, on your property based on if you're close to a single family house. Uh, they're doing some parking reforms to try and eliminate residential parking citywide so that the market can di dictate um, how much parking you put on a single family lot um, versus requiring two, two spaces per lot. Uh, they're also looking at you know reducing the minimum lot size, allowing three units by right, some additional subdivision reforms, and the kind of list actually goes on. So I will say that it's an active and interesting time to be part uh, of the process, um, but we also need members and community members to actually stay engaged to actually get a lot of these reforms over the finish line. Um, and these are kind of 10 year, you know, 10, 15 year goals that actually once are in place can have a big, big, big impact on our, our city, so. Awesome, thank you. And that'll be interesting to see how Dr. Losey's reports reflected. So ABOR has published several uh, housing reports this year. That, um, can you sort of summarize what you've been working on and, and the purpose uh, for f focusing on those sort of issues that are covered in those reports? Absolutely, and thanks so much um, to Taylor and his team for having me today. So as we've been sort of talking about housing solutions, right, undergirding those ideas is just the premise that home ownership is a valuable investment. And that's exactly what we showed in our buy versus rent index, which we discussed at our Central Texas Housing Summit in July. It shows that considering three different types of buyers, a first time buyer, a repeat buyer, and then a luxury buyer, in all three instances, Home ownership is the preferred housing tenure by which those households can build wealth. So, i.e., comparing purchasing a home versus renting and investing in the stock market, home ownership is shown to be the key mechanism by which households in the U.S. build wealth. And so, we feel that this is a really fundamental piece of research as we're moving forward again to really highlight that underlying premise, right? That home ownership is crucial, not only to our economy in terms of the 
um, you know, sales volume that is transacting through the housing market. And then, of course, the ripple effects in the construction industry, jobs market, et cetera. But it's also a way to show that homeownership is, is key to households being able to build wealth, especially those lower income households, right, who are experiencing more difficulty. They're just more barriers for those households to be enter, able to enter the housing market. So that's really the first big report. The second report was recently launched at the end of August, and it's on just missing housing in general in Austin. And by that, what we really mean is we're matching the demand for homes across particular income cohorts. So we're looking at extremely low-income households, very low-income households, low-income households, kind of those middle-income earners, and then those higher-income earners. So essentially thinking you know, below 80%, 80 to 120 percent and then above 120 percent of area median income earners. We're looking across those income cohorts and showing, depicting the demand for homes within each of those cohorts and then the ensuing supply of homes for sale on the market for each of those cohorts. And what we found, unsurprisingly, is that across different geographies, across both the city of Austin and Travis County, and different household sizes, i.e. two versus four person families. Of course, the shortage is concentrated among those lower income cohorts. So really those below 80% of area median income earners are going to have a pretty tough time being able to purchase a home in the Austin region as of now. So in terms of an actual income threshold, it depends on the size of the family itself, but kind of hovering around 90,000, that's really the threshold, um, you know, the income threshold a household needs to be able to meet on average to be able to purchase a home in the Austin region, again, as of now. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So before we get to more specific questions, Dr. Losey, one more for you. Set, set this stage for us. How would you describe the current state of the housing economy in Austin and Central Texas? So overall, in just as a, a plug for the release of our August housing stats and within hopefully the next couple of days, our market has fared well considering the elevated interest rate environment that we're currently in. And of course, mortgage rates actually averaged their highest in quite some time during the month of August. But again, look forward to those August housing stats. But overall, our market indicated a resilience that is somewhat surprising, just given the, the direction that mortgage rates took in August. So overall, I would say that we're fairly well positioned. Of course, we're coming off unsustainably high sales volume and um, you know growth in, in prices over the past couple of years, especially over 2020, 2021, and into kind of the first part of 2022. So we're, we're kind of normalizing in that sense, and we're returning to a more sustainable level of sales activity and price growth within, within the Austin region. Of course, we're still seeing some stabilizing just with the effects of broader economic trends on our housing market. But again, just the message there is that the housing market is performing relatively robustly. And with respect to our jobs market, Austin has really led the pack. Compared to both Texas and the US, our jobs growth continues to outpace those two geographies, especially in the sectors of professional and business services, leisure and hospitality, and mining, logging, and construction, just with all of kind of the natural resource development, you know, development of those companies um, kind of in the Austin area. So overall on the jobs market front, Austin is performing quite well. And two, I would note that just being such a tech heavy sector, we've actually been able to weather kind of, you know, the storm, if you will, that the tech industry more broadly has faced over the past year plus now. And information was only down in jobs growth by less than 1% in July. So again, just indicating that the Austin housing, or excuse me, the Austin jobs market is very well positioned within the context, right, of kind of the slowing, this cooling labor market more nationally. Awesome. Thank you. And just uh, as a uh, business point, if you've had buyers in the last two years that couldn't get in because they're battling everybody, give them a call. They're all coming out of the woodwork right now. A balanced market is opportunities for buyers and sellers. All right, let's go into 
Uh, Dr. Losey, one more for you. <laughs> At the end of August, August, ABOR published the truth about Austin middle, middle Missing Housing Report. I'll get it out eventually. Which compares the supply and demand for housing in Travis County and the city of Austin across price range. You sort of referenced that earlier. Can you give us a, an overview of that report and explain why it's important? Absolutely. So again, that report was really delving into the demand for homes across different income cohorts. Again, looking at those lower income cohorts versus kind of moderate income earners and then those those higher income earners. And then comparing that to the supply of homes for sale on the market from January of this year through June. So kind of a mid-year um, or first, first half of the year analysis. And again, we found that broadly speaking, the shortage of homes was concentrated among those lowest income earners. Again, really that below 80% of area median income earner is going to face quite a few obstacles in trying to purchase a home. And this report is particularly salient because it's going out right to policy makers, to city council members. So they're actually able to see concrete numbers on the effect of you know, higher home prices and higher interest rates on the ability of their constituents to purchase a home, right? And this is following up again on our buy versus rent index, which is showing, of course, that home ownership is the primary mechanism by which households in the U.S. build wealth, and it's really a fundamental source for households across the U.S. to be able to tap into those that wealth building potential. And I should say, too, that Taylor and I are working right now on a follow-up to the first truth about Austin's missing housing report that will delve into more geographies and that will break down um, more of the supply versus demand imbalance by racial categories. So we're trying to take the analysis a step further. So certainly be, be on the lookout for that in October or November. Awesome. And that's super helpful in all advocacy, I would imagine. All right, Jessica, so middle, middle miss, missing middle housing is something that many people point to when increasing housing supply, especially in urban areas. And AARP has been a big advocate for policy changes at the local and state levels to allow more of this type of housing. Could you define missing middle housing for us and highlight what it looks like and explain what type of home buyer would benefit? Sure. Um, so architect and um, urban planner David Parolik, who is the um, director of Opticos Design, coined the term missing middle housing. And it um, refers to a type of residence that is on the continuum between a detached single family home and a large multifamily apartment building. So these are um, single family in scale. And so they can fit within a single family neighborhood, but they're like a duplex, a triplex, a cottage court, a row house. Um, so they're not, you know, these huge buildings. They're, they're certainly at the scale of any regular single family neighborhood. And they are missing because since the 1940s in the United States, very few of these types of housing have been built. Um, and, and who would benefit from these are, um, what, let me start over. What we've seen in other areas like Nashville and other cities is that these are great housing options for people making 60% of the median income, um, family income of a neighborhood. So they are great for um, workforce housing, for folks entering the housing market for the first time. But what excites me about them is that they are great for family caregiving. So I have a volunteer who lives in Austin. Her two grown children with college degrees still live in her home because they can't afford anything in Austin at the time. She loves having them there. They're a great help. Um, she's had some injuries over the past few years that they have been critical to her health and safety. Would also like her own space and for them to have their own space. And so this allows for... Um, you know, multi-generational living where everyone has their own space, but a grandparent can help with childcare, um, which I know my parents depended on my grandparents for childcare when I was growing up, and it was wonderful. It also means that an adult child can be there to support their aging parent if needed, or an aging aunt or uncle or a sibling. Um, and so you're in the same space, but you have your own space, which we all, I think, often would like to have, um, regardless of our age. 
So it's, it's really great for that. And that's one of the reasons why AARP finds this so necessary to people's ability to age in place. And it's also great for the empty nester who just wants to downsize, but they don't want to leave their community. They want to stay in their neighborhood. They want to stay close to their church and their friends and their book club. Um, but they don't necessarily want the house to live in a house that's of the same size they raised their family in. Right. That's definitely not around. All right. Yeah, and they can't find, and these options aren't available for right. them. All right, let's discuss some barriers to housing and ownership. So Dr. Losey, what are the most, econ most common economic barriers to owning a home in Austin and Central Texas? Great question. So when we think about home ownership, of course, there are three primary constraints with respect to obtaining a mortgage loan. And of course, the majority of households rely on mortgage financing to be able to purchase a home. So those three constraints are income, wealth, and credit. And when we think about a mortgage loan, they're represented through the debt to income ratio, the loan to value ratio, and then of course the credit score. So the debt to income ratio, of course, is just that measure of household indebtedness relative to the household's income. And it can include just the mortgage debt or it can be the summation of the mortgage debt, credit card debt, car loan payments, et cetera. You know, the household's total debt um, relative to their income and then you know, the loan to value ratio is, of course, just the loan amount to the value of the home. So in essence, when we're thinking about those three constraints, of course, our lower income households tend to also be of lower wealth, right? So they're necessarily going to require a higher loan to value ratio to be able to enter the market for home ownership. Well, when you couple that with likely a higher debt to income ratio, because their incomes are lower, right, and any sort of debt that they carry is going to constitute a greater proportion of their household income. So when you're combining essentially a lower credit score, a higher debt-to-income ratio, and a higher loan-to-value ratio, then they're presenting more risk, right, to the lender. So it's just going to be that much more difficult for a lower-income household to be able to obtain mortgage financing. Right. So that's really the primary barrier that we're seeing, even if there is a home that is at a sufficient price that they could afford. You know, it's, those are of limited supply. But, you know, even if if there is, um, you know, a, a, an affordably priced home, being able to qualify for a mortgage loan for that home could be a pretty significant issue. So those are really the, the three primary barriers that we think of when we are considering a household's ability to actually purchase the home. Excellent, thank you. And Jessica, what are some of the most common barriers to creating the miss missing middle housing? So I think the largest barrier are exclusionary zoning laws. Yeah. Um, that's why this type of housing hasn't been built in the United States since the 1940s, because that's when these type of, of zoning laws really became popular for a number of reasons. Um, and so until we allow these type of houses, um, duplexes, triplexes, in a single family zoned area, it's going to be really hard for them to be built because often zoning jumps from detached single family to large scale apartment buildings and there's no place for this type of housing. Um, other things like minimum parking um, requirements can make this very hard because if it's a, a triplex and you have to have six even if they're you know, small and likely maybe only one person's living there, but you have to have six parking spots, that makes the land, enough land to put this on the, the lot can, can make that difficult. Um, uh, developer fees, having builders that build this type of housing, um, if it hasn't been allowed in a very long time, those developers might, or those builders might not be um, in the area when they, you know, when you can build them because they haven't been able to. And then, of course, there's um, just neighborhood fear that this type of housing will change the neighborhoods. And so a lot of folks fight against this because they like their neighborhood as it is, and they don't want to see it changed. And so they have concerns that this will somehow impact their property value, impact their taxes, impact traffic. And, and those are legitimate concerns that are, are worth looking at and listening to people um, but, you know, that definitely poses uh, a challenge to getting the, you know, zoning changed in cities like Austin. Yeah, Austin's well known for fighting that. All right, Taylor, on the end, 
what are the most common barriers to building a home in Austin, and and how can we just increase Austin's housing supply in general? Yeah, Jessica hit a lot of the points. Uh, um, they're very similar to Austin. Austin's really good at building um, very expensive housing and very deeply affordable housing, where we miss the mark. Um, and, and and granted, a lot of cities are missing this mark. It is building that uh, market rate affordable attainable housing, and a lot of that is due to um, the inability to create that missing middle. So in the city of Austin, it's regulatory uh, regulations like zoning that make it easier or essentially incentivize building a, a large single family house than, than trying to subdivide the property to get two units or three units or four units. Um, it's the devel development process. Um, uh, a McKinsey report um, was just released uh, a few weeks ago. Um, this was kind of spearheaded by Mayor Watson uh, when he came into office to look at uh, the city's site plan process and, and how long it takes to get a project through uh, that process. Um, and it can take anywhere between a year and a half to two years just to get a development through that process, which adds significant cost to bringing those housing units online. Um, so revising those uh, process and figuring out how we can work together to bring that down to the average of uh, other cities is, is a big deal too. Uh, development fees, as we also talked about, is a, a big factor. Uh, last year, we released a report that showed the city of Austin, on average, has about $25,000 more in development fees uh, per unit uh, than our, our peer cities across uh, the state and in Central Texas which $25,000, that's a significant chunk of change that could impact somebody's ability to attain that house. Um, and then as Jessica said also, just the kind of misconception of what missing housing looks like or will do to a community. Um, I always point to Terrytown. Terrytown I think is a great example of how missing middle works. You have very large homes, very nice homes, also next to very nice missing middle homes. You have cottage courts, you have town homes, and it works. Everybody, not maybe not everybody, people want to live in Terrytown. If I could afford Terrytown, I would do that in a heartbeat. Um, but how can we replicate Terrytown and make that legal again? So, so that if you wanted to build a Terrytown, you could do that. You could not do that today under our current regulations and the process, just because it's, it's impossible. For sure. All right, let's, uh, we'll give this one up, one for everybody, whoever wants to go first. So given the economic challenges that Central Texas faces, are there meaningful policies that can move the needle on the local level? And what can cities and counties do to help soften the impact of rising inflation and lower the cost of housing? I mean, we're not unique, right? This is a nationwide, if not worldwide, problem. So who's doing something that's working? What's going on? Well, I'll start, and then I, I know Jessica has some really good points as well. Uh, the first thing I think is just kind of focusing on making data-driven decisions. Um, the city of Austin released a, a, a housing, um, a, a strategic plan uh, back in 2017 to kind of set some goals of this is how much housing we won't need to meet the growth uh, and demand. Those numbers are completely outdated, and they need to be revised. Even when we, I was at council when, uh, when we worked on that, that strategic plan, and I can assure you that some of those numbers, you know, don't truly reflect the growth in demand, and particularly now, we've seen uh, uh, bigger growth in our, in our population. So, revising uh, um, our goals and making sure we continue to revise those to actually reflect um, the demand that is here is the first thing. Um, looking at reducing um, the minimum lot size and allowing three units by right uh, on, in, on residential zones will also go a long way. Those aren't overnight changes. Uh, those will take you know, probably 10 to 15 years to actually see some substantial um, increases in our housing stock, but that will help move that needle. Um, removing parking regulations um, also will help. You know, If a homeowner can choose to add a second unit or even a second bedroom um, in place of an ex additional parking spot that reduces the cost of providing that housing in, in Austin. Um, re reducing compatibility standards. So compatibility standards um, determines how high you can build a building, essentially. So in the city of Austin, um, if you have a single family house, um, right next to that you could have another single family property 
or, or a multifamily property, but that property next to that single family house is limited on how high it could build because of its proximity to uh, that single family house. Um, and a report just came out from the city that talked about how can we revise that policy. Right now, the current standards go 540 feet um, from one single family property that determine how you can do it. The best example I give is, give is Camp Mayberry. It's technically zoned single family. So when Westminster wanted to add additional housing units on, on their property, they actually couldn't build an additional floor, which I think was about 10 to 15 units because of Camp Mayberry across the highway on Mopac. And so we're looking at how can we unlock existing, uh, existing um, units to allow those units to be built. Um, I, city staff, I think, is recommending uh, reducing that to 75 feet. Um, apparently, 75 feet is the standard average width of a highway. Uh, did not know that. Um, but just by reducing 75, uh, compatibility to 75 feet, you essentially unlock, according to the city of Austin, 71,472 additional units, potentially. Um, and that, that could be overnight, you know? Uh, or I mean, obviously not overnight, you have to build them. But th that's a, that'd be a significant impact. And so, you know, just looking at changes like that can go a long way. Yeah. Jessica, you wanna give a shot at it? Sure, so I am not an expert on inflation or the market. <laughs> You all are much better, um, can talk about all of that much better than I can. But I do believe that increasing housing stock um, will allow for um, the prices of housing to regulate for those middle income earners. So reducing lot size and allowing three units by right, um, the compatibility standards, all of the things that he just spoke about um, will create more housing in Austin and more middle income, ideally more middle income housing in Austin. And that will allow for more people to enter the housing market. Um, my first home, it was in Louisiana, but it was a stacked duplex. And it was what my husband and I can afford and it was great. Um, and now it's a rental property for us. And then hopefully one day that will pay off the house we're in now when the time comes. I mean, these are great opportunities for, for, for young families and older adults alike. So if we legalize it and we can build more, um, hopefully they won't cost what Terrytown. The goal, and I don't have a crystal ball, is that if we build them, they won't cost what Terrytown or even Mueller does right now because they are legal throughout the city. So. Right. right, they're not quite exclusive. All right, Dr. Lewis, do you have anything to add? Sure. So I'll just touch briefly on regulations. And of course, today we've been focused primarily on minimum lot size. We have to remember that re regulations can come in a variety of forms, right? Anything from minimum lot size to kind of on the opposite end of that would be something like an environmental regulation. You know, think of the Barton Creek Preserve, uh, Habitat Preserve, you know, kind of in Southwest Austin. So any sort of regulation is going to impose an artificial constraint on our ability to otherwise supply housing on that particular piece of property, right? So a minimum lot size requirement is, um, you know, imposing a constraint on our ability to supply housing at more dense housing, right? It's limiting our ability to increase our density. So kind of thinking along that spectrum, again, anytime we have any sort of regulation on a piece of land, it's going to inflate the price of homes or the rent of housing units beyond a level that they otherwise would not have seen. So just considering all of that, you know, it's kind of important for us to consider incentives, I think, for builders and developers to try to counteract the premium, right, that these regulations are imposing on their developments. So density incentives, you know, the density bonuses, um, looking at inclusionary zoning in which developers receive some sort of kickback, right, for providing a sort, certain percentage of units within that particular development to more affordable, um, to, to lower income households, you know, at more affordable rent levels. So thinking about kind of more holistically how we can encourage more supply is also, you know, considering counteracting existing measures, right, that are diminishing the ability of builders and developers to put that supply on the ground and inflating the cost of doing so, right? 
and, and kind of building off of that, I know our s state and our national association are also working on trying to develop ways to incentivize more housing. So at NAR, uh, the National Association of Realtors, they're looking at how can they encourage Congress to approve meaningful incentives to, to get um, uh, builders to essentially build more, more more units across the country to fill the gap. Um, we just came from the Texas Realtors Conference this past week in San Antonio. They're starting to build out their priorities for the next uh, legislative session, uh, the, the 89th legislative session. And, and a big topic was how can we get more housing on the ground? And so I, I think we'll see over the coming months, not even locally, and um, the state and the, fed, uh, the federal associations will kind of also help take the lead in, in pushing that at all levels. Awesome. Yeah, and kickbacks is a frowned upon term. <laughs> Incentivized. Rebates. <laughs> all right, let's, uh, let's do our final kind of panel question, and then we'll go to uh, the audience for some questions. All right, from, uh, we'll start with you, Jessica, how's that? All right, from your perspective, what do you think the next several months and years look like for the economy and housing in Central Texas, and what are sort of major issues you think our market will face, and how can we, as Realtors, help? Well, for, from AARP um, standpoint, as I mentioned before, um, we are a rapidly aging community, and while this is not a, again, a na not a natural disaster, yeah. but we do need infrastructure to support us as we age. But we also know that what is good for an 80-year-old is also good for an for an eight-year-old. So when we think about infrastructure that supports us as we age, we're not ignoring young families. Right. Because if an older adult can walk to the store, so can a mom with a stroller and a child. So my hope is that we, we look at these demographics and we address them appropriately. And we build, we continue to build walkable um, communities with close access, access to transit and other trans multimodal transportation options that we you know, we build more housing, this type of housing, more smaller homes um, that are more affordable to people, again, of all ages. And I think that there is a, a will to do that in Austin. And I just hope that that, um, that that continues. But at the end of the day, I think the market will, will determine. So if big houses on big lots are, are, are what the market wants, then I think that's what, that's what we'll see. And that's what you'll see. But I um, I believe that there is a market for this type of housing. Yeah, so. that's for sure. That's very apparent. That that's it's high demand. You guys have anything to add? What else have we got coming down the pipe? Yeah, I think uh, coming from the city, Austin City Council, um, they're going to keep moving through all the code changes that they initiated uh, earlier this spring. So we think the the first thing that's going to be coming to them is the co compatibility discussion. Uh, we, we anticipate that will come in October. Um, knowing staff, they're probably still writing the, the ordinance, and so there'll be a bigger community conversation on that. Um, parking also will come sometime this fall. My assumption is towards the end, end of the fall uh, to, to look at you know completely eliminating uh, parking requirements citywide. Um, and then the three units by right, we also anticipate sometime in November, December, um, to start the kind of having that final discussion at council, uh, the reducing minimum lot size, my, tens, my, my assumption is it'll be earlier spring. Um, and then the rest, I mean, there's a huge list of other code amendments that they're working through that process. Um, elections also start again next year. And so we'll see how many uh, code amendments they can uh, get approved and finalized before the election season starts. Um, and the, even the mayor's up for re-election because they're moving the uh, mayor's race to the, the uh, presidential years. And so he you know, drew a two-year term this year. And so we'll also see how, how close um, council can stay united until the campaign season starts. I would say how realtors can help um, is really just kind of help us um, get information out there to your clients, to your community members. Um, help you know combat some of the misinformation that's out there. Um, you know, if if there is you know concern of how will this impact my neighborhood, let us know, and we'll try and get some examples. Again, we aren't the experts in building uh, neighborhoods or building homes, uh, but we can certainly partner with AARP or uh, the architects um, to get some examples of what this type of housing might actually look like in your neighborhood. 
Um, you know, we're not advocating to build skyscrapers in na every neighborhood. We're asking for some small incremental changes to allow additional units throughout the city. And so also a big reminder that I always point out too is deed restrictions. If, if you live in a neighborhood that has deed restrictions, um, sit, no matter what the city does, they cannot trump your deed restrictions. And so also communicating that to your client that if they are buying in a community that has deed restrictions that are enforceable, that, that, that trumps, you know, even if they wanted to build two units, if their deed restrictions say one unit, that's, that's a hurdle they would have to overcome before they could build that second unit. And vote, right? You should all vote. <laughs> I would just add to that point that affordability constraints are likely going to continue in the central Texas region our population and jobs growth is anticipated to outpace that of Texas. And so we're, we're poised to see over the next seven years, up from 2020 to 2030, we're, we're positioned to see about a 30% increase in our labor market just on the jobs front. So with that kind of, of growth, you know, just with our as we've been discussing our limits in the supply of homes available on the market, especially the, that affordable inventory, you know, it seems like all odds are pointing to just us continuing to see those affordability constraints across the board. So again, thinking about supply coming down the pipeline, right? Any supply that we're not building today are homes that people are not going to be able to buy a year or two years from now. So those ripple effects really do play a role in our housing market. So the faster that we can ameliorate some of these existing restrictions, if you will, on our ability to supply new housing, the more quickly we'll be able to reduce some of those affordability constraints. So like Taylor said, you know, just as realtors advocating for reductions in development fees, you know, advocating for um, higher density housing, you know, advocating for the right kind of regulations, you know, of course, there's a role for regulations, but there's also a balance to them. So thinking very carefully and methodically through the ways, about the ways in which we'll be able to increase our housing supply today, right again, to diminish some of those affordability constraints tomorrow and into the future. Awesome, thank you. I mean, the demand is there for developers. We just gotta get out of the way sometimes in an organized fashion, how's that? All right, let's go back to, that's all our pre-planned questions. So we'll turn it over to Elizabeth and she will walk us through all our audience questions. Thank you. Thank you all so much for the very informative panel. Um, I think there's a lot of great takeaways. We've had a few questions come in, so I'll, we'll try to get through as many as possible before 11 o'clock. Um, the first question I have is, is there a plan to redefine a single family residence, especially in light of multi-generational and extended families living together, allowing multiple kitchens and not kitchenettes could help alleviate housing and senior care concerns? The first answer, I would say, I don't know the complete answer, but we'll try and work on getting you an answer for that. Yes, they are looking at um, all kinds of changes related to ADUs and single family. Um, I think the question comes from to have like a, a livable unit, you have to have a, a working kitchen and a bathroom. Um, so for an ADU, just having a small like hot plate doesn't suffice as, as that. So there might be discussions in the future as part of the ADU conversation to uh, change that, um, but I, I don't know. Um, our next question, and Jacob, you might be able to add to this. Um, how can realtors explain to their clients that missing middle housing is not going to change the, the character of their neighborhood? Uh, yeah, I'll give it a shot. Um, you just kind of take away, and I'm trying not to curse, the fear out of it. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's, it's not a scary thing. There's areas where it works very, very well. Uh, it's not going to ruin everything, and, you, you know, there's going to be cars up and down your street or whatever it is. Like, there, there's just a lot of, it's fear-mongering, and it just needs to be called out as that because that's what it is. And, and it can be done in a correct way, and if you want to help that process, there'd be a part of the process to help it done, be done in the right way. 
Um, I just wanted to, shameless plug, but AARP, and this is free on our website, we have a missing middle, discovering and developing missing middle housing guide. And it goes through a number of case studies from throughout the, throughout the country and lots of examples of what missing middle housing look lo looks like. And it is lovely and not at all scary. And I don't think anything anyone would, um, most people would not want in their neighborhood. I think um, what has worked well in a lot of communities is doing walking tours where missing middle housing um, does exist in taking folks and showing them those communities. Um, I think AARP certainly has a role to play with our members and sharing information and resources with them. Um, and, and that is our plan um, throughout the rest of the year and into next year to have webinars and different opportunities to share information about what this is and what it looks like and what it means in reality for neighborhoods and communities. And I would also say, you know, just listening as well and, and making sure you understand the concerns that you're hearing because, you know, I, I can understand if I bought a property and this is my investment, this is my livelihood, but this could be my retirement. Um, and, and, and if I hear things that, you know, an apartment complex or even a three-story building is going to be built next to me, I could understand that that's that going to cause a lot of concern. Or even just more people on a street, you know, that means more traffic, less parking, uh, so making sure we understand those concerns and trying to address them properly, you know, um, because again, as Jessica said, we're trying to create additional small scale, um, um, additional housing throughout the city that will help house our growing population. Um, kind of building off that question, uh, what would the other side say, right? So what do opponents of the three unit by right and the home resolution or minimum lot size um, or even compatibility, what do the opponents of these initiatives say? What's their argument? I mean, I think it varies a lot. Uh, some talk about environmental, the impact on environmental. You're going to have more impervious cover. You're going to create more drainage. Um, it's interesting. We, we've seen in other states, some of the environmentalists has, have actually come on board with allowing more missing middle, more dense communities because they see the impact that has on, on actually potentially reducing uh, climate impact changes. Um, but those are significantly concerns that, that even the city of Austin is talking through is what does that look like on our, our streams on our, 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 when it floods? You know, so talking through those environmental issues I think is an important step as well. Uh, parking is always a big issue. Um, but then I think a lot of it comes down to I bought in a single family neighborhood, I want to live in a single family neighborhood. That's exactly what it looks like today. Um, I would argue some single family neighborhoods, you could still be a single family neighborhood, they're just going to be smaller homes on smaller lots. Um, so th there's a number, number of issues, I think. Jessica, do you have anything? I think you, yeah, I think you, um, you covered them. What, I, what I've heard at council and, and from other opponents are exactly what you said, the environmental concerns around impervious cover. But we know that folks are moving to Austin regardless. So are they going to live here or are they going to live in Kyle and drive in? Um, and th those kind of emissions are going to have a negative impact on our environments if we continue to just sprawl out from Austin. Um, so we certainly, um, and this is a way to mitigate that, envir that particular environmental impact by allowing people to actually live in Austin where they work. Um, and, and, and where they spend their time. Um, so, and then again, like you said, you know, I, what, I think what's important that folks understand is that we see missing middle housing as single family housing. Mm -hmm. These are not large multifamily apartment buildings. These are residential single family scale units that do fit comfortably within that traditional single family neighborhood and that is the goal this is not like you said to put giant buildings in these neighborhoods and so it's kind of just making sure folks are aware of what this actually is good. oh go ahead Did you, i'd also say that another one i heard is uh, property taxes this is going to yeah. increase my property taxes um and according to you know uh, the uh, the tax assessor she, she did a very good explanation of at least in travis county um they compare similar properties to similar properties. So if a duplex gets built next to your single family house, that duplex is not 
compared to your single family house because it's a duplex, not a single family house. Now, obviously, how does that impact the actual land value? Land value is going to continue, uh, my assumption, the rise in Austin, regardless of whether we allow additional housing or not. Um, but if you allow more units on uh, smaller lots, then you actually reduce, you know, if you can put three units on a million dollar lot, that's a lot cheaper than one house on a million dollar lot. Yeah, I think that is a big, at least that's the thing that I hear most in terms of opposition is it's going to increase my property taxes. So I think as realtors explaining to your clients that that's not the case is really impactful. Um, and this question might be for Taylor or Jessica. Um, Minneapolis is a good example of making housing attainable and curbing inflation. Are there any efforts to partner with other cities to learn and share best practices? And kind of going along with that, are there any examples of cities that are doing missing middle housing well? Um, and what would that look like? Page three of the report. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Minneapolis is referenced in here as well as Nashville. Those are two mm -hmm. um, places where it has worked well. It has done what it has intended to do, which is increase housing stock and stabilize housing prices for, they're still building big big houses that, that folks with a lot of money want to build. Um, and so those did not go away. But for folks who do want that middle income housing, they have successfully allowed them to to enter the housing market. I know I was speaking, and I, I know we're always nervous about saying California um, <laughs> in Austin, but I was talking to our director of our California office yesterday, and they put together a number of videos um, with OptiCoast Design from cities across California where they have implemented this, and it has worked. And I was talking about sharing, being able to share some of those videos um, here um, in Austin with our members so they can see these opportunities. Um, there are definitely opportunities to learn from other cities, but also Austin has some good examples here. Yeah. The Mueller development is a perfect example of how additional missing middle housing close together can work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, well, we've hit 11 a.m. So um, if y'all wouldn't mind joining me in thanking Taylor and Dr. Lucy, Jessica, and Jacob for the panel. That was a great discussion. Thank y'all so much. Um, and thank you all for coming today. A quick reminder, we have a few advocacy events upcoming. Tomorrow, we have Cheers to Tree Pack, which is a happy hour that's benefiting the Abor Foundation. Um, it'll be at the Brutorium from 4.30 to 7.30. So tickets are available at the door, $25. Please come, bring a friend. It'll be a great time. Um, and then in October, on October 26th, we have Abor City Hall visits, which you're welcome to register for. It's a half day event where we go and meet with council members and basically advocate for the things that we were just discussing today. So if that's something that interests you, we'd love to have you join us. It should be a very great event. So thanks again for coming. We appreciate all of you and have a great rest of your day. Keep the tree